Welcome to Wednesday night. I'm many glad to be here Wednesday night. All of you that are watching, and Monday was great. Wasn't Monday great? The great outpouring of, of so many people who came to this house and filled it full of prayer. God came for our words. We are next week, the beginning of a new season. On Friday will be Rosh Hashanah, which will be the beginning of a new year. This is the first month in the biblical calendar. God is focusing in. God has planned this from the beginning of man, how he would do this. Books are open on the Day of Atonement. That will be the 24th of September. We will start, we will start beginning next Wednesday with our expectation and beginning Friday for 10 days, we'll begin to pray, we'll begin to repent. For the Bible says that for 10 days, we should prepare ourselves to repent, ask God to cleanse us, to touch us. Then the day of atonement, this is all biblical, in which that God will make decisions about your life, about the world, about if he should come back, then the next eight days are celebration. This whole festivities that starts with Rosh Hashanah is called Feast of Tabernacles. Some call it Feast of Trumpets. In the midst of that is the Day of Atonement. And in the midst of that is when God pours out his spirit double upon the people of God. So whatever is happening to you right now Get ready for double things to happen. Any good things that are happening to you. Everybody say double, double. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna read to you something and David, uh, it's, we're gonna start with page 74 or 73 in the seven blessings of atonement. Just keep it right there, uh, Tavon. Because I wanna show you something that is very scriptural about what you're going through right now every person right now this is what you're going through and there is pressure and chaos and inclement weather and like right now there are four there are four um, storms brewing right now in the Atlantic they don't know if they will turn into such in which they will become destructive to the land but there's four that is brewing right now there's earthquakes that are happening nations are rising against nation economic dow jones economy is 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 wobbling there's all kinds of things happening right now because you must understand we are in warfare warfare what do i mean by that the devil is fighting against you you need to understand the devil is fighting you. The devil is fighting me. He's fighting God. And he's fighting anyone that even gets close to God. Now those that are not close to God, that is not a battle for the enemy. The enemy works on people who are close to God, who have been born again, who are striving. You must understand that we, the people of God are the most powerful people on the earth against the enemy of our soul. You must understand that we are the people of light. All of you are light. All of you are salt. If I could describe you with the whole armor of God. When you're born again, God gives you the whole armor. You look like robocops. You are light. You're like a candle in the darkness on the job, on your block, everywhere you go. So Satan is trying to blow your light out. He's trying to snuff your batteries out. Get rid of the light, come against you. He knows exactly who to go after because he knows where Jesus is. And Jesus is on the inside of the believer. We are the light. Everybody say, we are the light. Let me show you how the battle is raging 
in the last days. And when we talk about last days and scriptures, when we talk about last days, they're really referring, if you rightly divide the word of God, people will say the last days are right before Jesus will come. The last days will be when the end of prophecy and all of these things like the river Euphrates drying up, one world government, you begin to see the wars and rumors of wars, the pestilences. You begin to see all of these things that are written and that much violence will be upon the earth and all of the turmoil that is, is happening that was biblically prophesied. And the Bible refers to them as the last days. But if you will look closely, the last days are meaning right before the first month or before Rosh Hashanah, or before a new season. These are also considered the last days. So I would tell you that right now, we are just a few days away from a new season. These would be called biblically the last days. You are in the last days. So God talks to Moses and tells him specifically what is going to happen right before the new season. And the Bible says in the book of Deuteronomy, it says in, these, in, in, in the scriptures of the fourth chapter and the 29th verse, but if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, and this is the 10 days he's referring to as he's talking to Moses, thou shalt find him. Everybody say, I'll find him. So God is saying, turn to me, you're gonna find me. And if thou seek him with all of thy heart and with all of thy soul, it goes on to say in the next verse, when thou art in tribulation and all of these things come upon thee, even in the latter days. Now let me read it to you in a translation. Keep that right up there, but I'm gonna read it in another translation. But from where there you will seek the Lord your God and you will find him, you will seek him with all of your heart and with all of your soul. Now listen to this, when you are in distress and all of these things come upon you in the latter days, when you turn to the Lord God and obey his voice, for the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not forsake you nor destroy you nor forget the covenant of your fathers which we swore to them. I just want to declare unto you, if you feel any distress, it's supposed to happen now. Meaning that the pressures of whatever it might be is only signaling to you that you are about to get a release of God's goodness upon your life. And if you know that, if you know that, you know that you can tell your weak flesh there's a breakthrough coming. God's going to do mighty things in my life. God is about to pour out. And I just want to tell you a few testimonies as Tavon is helping me and the musicians. The Spirit of the Lord is here in a mighty way. I'm going to, I'm going to declare unto everyone that whatever distress you're going through or what I'm going through, that we know that in the name of Jesus, it is a signal. It is the last days for the beginning of a new season. It's coming. The day of atonement is coming. God is strategically strategizing good things in your life, which we will learn tonight. And so I want to say to everyone under the sound of my voice, everyone, prepare your hearts Get ready to seek God with all of your heart because God has got some things in store for you that you have no idea even what it is, even though you're praying for certain things, God has got something bigger and even better than you could even imagine. Let me tell you a few things that are happening amongst us. Two weeks ago, and she's here tonight, I believe, sister came to me uh, three weeks ago and says, I have cancer in my lymph nodes, 
and would you pray for me? And so we prayed and prayed for her, believing that God would heal her of the cancer in her lip notes. And then Sunday she came to me, I believe she's here tonight, and she said they took another test. They took x-rays. And she smiles as she's telling me this, and she is saying, they cannot find the cancer in those lymph nodes. Is she here tonight? I think she is here. If she's here, would you stand? Are you here? She said she would be here tonight. There is another great miracle that happened when you mentioned Sunday, that people called in for prayer. And it was Kathy Skurlock's uh, nephew, a relative who, who was carried off the field last Wednesday night. It was last Wednesday night. They were playing a football game and he was carried to the hospital and they claimed that he was paralyzed, possibly broke his neck. And so Kathy Skurlock calls the prayer line and she does it at nine o'clock because Pastor John is on the line at nine o'clock sharp Monday through Friday. You should get that number everybody because it's a live prayer meeting. 30 minutes, Monday through Friday. And it's also a prayer meeting early in the morning, 6 to 6.30, along with the prayers that are going on here in the auditorium. And so the phone call came in and Kathy said, please pray for my nephew. The prayer team, which is, can be as high as 150 to 200 people that, that are online every single night at nine o'clock live with Pastor John, or at six o'clock in the morning, that number can vary. And they begin to pray for him. They don't know him, but the call came in to pray. And let me just tell you, when the people of God begin to pray and agree, prayer works. We don't even, we don't know the young man. We've never met the young man, but somebody from this congregation, Kathy, called and said, pray for him. God answers prayer. It was critical. It was paralyzed critical. It is that serious. But the next morning when he awakened in the hospital, he got up and walked out on his own free will. Prayer works. Other testimonies that are coming in, so many, Another testimony is, is in the last 10 or 15 days, we are, not up to, I, we are up to nine people now who have told us this from our congregation that they got a letter in the mail and their debt was canceled and released. And these nine people, the ninth one came in today, Pastor John said, and a quarter of a million dollars was forgiven, meaning there's been nine FCC members that we know about that there's been over a million and a half dollars debt has been canceled. Oh, you should clap. It may not be you, but you should clap anyway because why the last few days? Why not six months ago? Because God is finishing up, finishing up right now, the, for, the former rain's blessing. God has only got till today, till next Friday, that God, who says, I will bless you moderately with the former rains from Passover unto atonement. Now, these are the last few days. God has probably been blessing you moderately. All of us, he's been blessing moderately for the last six months. And it's not been with double portion. So if any kind of blessing has come upon you, you can count that double is going to start beginning next Friday. And that God is finishing up his schedule of pouring out the former rains upon his people. So you're getting that blessing now, but God then says, this is only a taste of what I'm getting ready to do. So what does the devil do? The devil puts tension. 
the devil puts much tension on our faith and upon our minds. But I want to tell you tonight, victory is already on its way. Breakthrough is already on its way. Great things are about to happen in your life. In the name of Jesus. If you want that breakthrough, stand to your feet, everybody. Lift your hands and begin to say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let the, let the, let the presence of God come upon you right now. Let the last days of the former rains come upon you right now. Holy are you, O oh God. Thank you for your spirit, O oh God. Hallelujah for your presence. Healing is in this house, O oh God. The power of the Holy Spirit is right there where you are. And the power of God. And everybody's lifting holy hands and say, I receive. I receive. The former rains. I am expecting the double portions to come on my life. I will be healed. I will be delivered. I will be debt free. Prosperity is coming upon me. Now everybody in this room, here's what God likes. God likes for us to seal anything we ask him, anytime we're in his presence. God is into strong praise. So let's seal the deal by clapping our hands saying hallelujah praise comes out praise comes out praise comes out we will praise you we will honor you we will magnify you thank you Jesus thank you Jesus thank you Jesus Now, I'm going to teach you one more thing while you're standing for a moment. Your praise must crush and be louder than your tension. Now, watch this. When I begin to break through, through my headaches and obligations, my schedules, my brain, all of our brains right now are just full of stuff. When I begin to take my vocal cords and praise him, you got to get louder than what your mind is speaking to you about. Notice that when you praise him, for you that are new at this, and you say, thank you, Lord, but your mind is still functioning. You're still hearing somebody next to you, worried about somebody behind you. Or you might be hearing somebody's real loud four rows behind you. You got to take your praise until your mind, your sight, your hearing, your touching, you're feeling the five senses are dominated by praise. Because when you, re when you really pray, I mean, you just, just start saying, thank you, Lord, and forget about everything. I mean, just drop it, all your cares, everything. In fact, the Bible teaches us, cast all your care upon me. You begin to do that. Forget about what people think about you. Something will snap. Something will break in the spirit realm. So let me teach you this. The Bible says, I ask the question, where is God? The Bible says, God is in the praises. Listen, God is in the praises. So the tension and the sickness and the pain and all that we're going through will stop the presence of God because it will try to dominate you. You then begin to lift your voice to dominate your thought patterns. 
You can't praise God silently. God says, if you don't praise me, I'll raise rocks up to praise me. There is no such thing as a silent praiser. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Shout with the voice of triumph. Sing aloud unto God and praise Him. I praise you, God. I love you, God. I believe in you, God. I thank you, Jesus. I magnify you, oh God. Holy are you, oh God. You are a mighty God. I lift my voice above my distress. I magnify you, for you are my God. You are the only God. I love you, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And everybody say hallelujah. hallelujah. And you may be seated on that. That distress should be gone for a little while now. Thank you. So the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Teaches us in the 23rd verse of the second chapter, Joel dealing, this whole chapter deals with this season of atonement. Be glad. That's a key word that God wants all of his children to note. Be glad. In fact, God gives this point of reference so that we will know that the only way God will allow us to receive is that there's got to be gladness. So you got to break through your misery, you got to break through your sadness, you got to break through your pain, you got to break that, and you got to say, I'm going to be glad. Somebody say, I'm going to be glad. Of course, children of Zion, Zion is the Old Testament church, or we could say that, the children of the church. Rejoice in the Lord your God, He's given you the former rain moderately. This is where we are now. And now he says he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain, beginning a week from Friday, which will be Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of a new season. And I don't know about you, but I'm excited about God's new season in our life. Thank you guys, thank you so much. Just for a few minutes, I wanna tell you what's going to happen. And all of you that's got the book, Seven Blessings of Atonement, as you get it, you should get it out. You should have it on your coffee table. You should review it because here's what's going to happen and that is, is that God is going to release seven blessings that you will find in this chapter of, the 20, of, the, uh, of, of Joel 2. Joel is a minor prophet. Joel is one of the books in back of the Old Testament. Joel is referred to in the book of Acts on the day of Pentecost or when the church started on the day of Pentecost. And Joel 2 is repeated by Simon Peter. And it is a book in which is, is, is gives us great instruction on what is going to happen, when it's going to happen, and what we are to do when the season comes, earlier in the chapter, earlier in this second chapter of Joel, it will teach you we are to blow the trumpet. Now next Wednesday night, I'm gonna blow the shafar because I won't be with you Friday except if, unless you're with me in prayer and that I will blow the shafar and I will declare with a trumpet sound, it begins, the season will begin. It says here in the 10th verse, when it will begin is when there is darkness that sets upon the earth. 
The 10th verse says, in the same chapter of the second chapter of Joel, it says, the earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall not withdraw their shining. It will be dark for two nights, there will be no moon, this will mark Rosh Hashanah. This will be the beginning, and God even marks it. The Bible talks about that he uses the stars, the moon, the sun, he uses the heavens to speak to us. Even the constellation he uses to speak to us. So now this chapter is telling us exactly what is to be done. And then he says, when that happens, he says, therefore, rend your heart and not your garments and turn unto the Lord God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and repenteth him of evil. Blow the trumpet in Zion, the 15th verse goes on to say, and call a fast and a solemn assembly. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, and gather the children and those that suck the breast, let the bridegroom go forth and is out of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priest minister of the Lord weep between the porch and altar. It will be the responsibility of us elders and, and we that are in ministry. This is a time in which we should go into travail, into prayer, weeping travail and seeking God, in fasting and praying and that we will say, spare the people. Spare the people. Spare the people, O Lord God, and give not our inheritance to a reproach, that the heathen should rule over them, for they should say among themselves, where is their God? We will pray and we will fast, and we will say, O God, O God, do not let the heathen rule over us. And we will say, spare the people. Whose people? God's people and that we will never be ashamed. And the Bible teaches us, he says, he says, the Lord, then will the Lord be jealous for his land or his people and pity his people. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, behold I, behold, I will send you corn. I will send you corn. I will send you wine and oil. This is all a part of prosperity, of God undergirding, making sure that all of your needs and he will supply all of your needs. This is an outpouring of tremendous prosperity. And you shall be satisfied therewith, and I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen. And God's getting ready for a whole lot of you that people are going to ask, how do you have that? What is going on with you financially? Even your own relatives. Not man. But God is going to cause men to give unto your bosom. It goes on to say in the same chapter, in the same setting, it says, be glad we read that. And then he says, then he says on the 24th verse, it, when he talks about the double portion, he immediately goes on the 24th verse and says, and the floor shall be full of wheat and the vat shall overflow with wine and oil. Now he's already told us he's going to start with the corn and the wine and the oil. But now he is saying, this is going to be so much that there's going to be overflow. And then he goes on and says, I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, and my great army which I sent among you. Whether you know it or not, some of you don't probably, maybe you know, maybe you don't know, but there is someone or something has been stealing from you. Stealing your health, stealing your family, stealing your time, stealing your joy, stealing your money. You may not be missing any, but, but, but the palmer worm is stolen from you. And there are things that you, even the caterpillar and the canker worm, and notice these are worms and notice this is a caterpillar. This is things that are hid that you can't see that they're in the ground, they're, in the, they're not visible. So there are things that have stolen from you and most of you, I would say, you don't know it has been stolen, but you know that something is not functioning right and, 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 and it's been an underground movement of the canker worm and the locust has come to eat. But here's what God said, I'm gonna send a great army and you're going to get it back. 
whatever has been stolen from you. So the three things that God's going to do, that he's going to begin to do, and this is all going to be happening in just a few days. Get ready. The first one is going to be double portion. Second is going to be financial abundance. The reason why the stock market adjusts right now, the reason why that uh, the, the, the fourth quarters and the first quarters are better than the second and third, because the fourth quarters and the, and the first quarters are in the double portion segment from atonement to Passover. The economics are built around the seasons of God. You should spend less, but we spend more, and most of our money is spent that we have extra by August because either Mickey has got it or the boat has got it or the vacation has got it. But if we were smart, we would not spend anything from Easter until, until atonement because we are being blessed moderately. You spend your money in the fourth and the first quarters because double portion is on you and you will be able to meet all of your needs. All of this economic education is in the seasons of God. So God is teaching man that I'm going to give you double portion. I'm going to give you financial abundance. And then he says, I'm going to restore. I'm going to restore. There's going to be restoration in your relationships with your children. Uh, things are going to be healed. Something is, is going to happen. People are going to apologize. People are going to come back in your life possibly. And, and there's, going to be, there's going to be peace. There's something of restoration. Whatever the enemy has stolen from you, God is going to give it back. And when he gives it back, he's going to give it back double to you. The fourth thing that's going to happen is there's going to be supernatural miracles that are going to happen to you. The next verse says you shall eat plenty. You may have not been eating plenty in your health. You may not have had enough in your finances, but you're, you're, you're getting ready to eat plenty and you're going to be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God. And here is the miracle part. That hath dwelt wondrously with you. Look at the word wondrously. In other words, God's getting ready to do wonders. It, in other words, when it happens to you, you will go, oh, that's a wonder. I didn't know that there was going to happen. That's a wonder. God has got some wonders packaged up right now. If you will respond to the season, there are wonders that are going to happen. Wonderful things are going to take place. Favor is going to be upon your life. And here's what he says, my people, religious people, people that are born again that kind of feel left out because, you know, we are the minority in the world and people make fun of God's people sometimes. God is saying these words, oh, you're not going to be ashamed. My people will never be ashamed. They will know who their God is and they will know who is blessing them. And God is going to, somebody give him a great big hand clap. That's the fourth thing God is going to do. And then the fifth thing is that God is going to put divine presence upon you. Then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. I am the Lord your God. There is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. He constantly is saying this over and over. I know you feel like I'm not there. I know you feel like, where am I? I know you sense, God, are you even listening? I've been seeking you for weeks. I've been going through some stuff for weeks. God says, I promise you one thing. You will not be ashamed. I'm not going to let you down. You're going to know that I am God. And somebody shout a great big amen. He goes on to say, he goes on to say, and that is the, the, the fifth thing is the, is the, is the divine presence because he says, I'm going to be in your midst. And the sixth thing that he does is that he goes after your family. Listen to what he says, and it shall come pass afterwards. Now, this is going to be in the next six months. This is going to take place. He says, and it shall come to pass afterwards. The first four things he does right away, and they start moving in your life. But here's what starts happening in the next few weeks and months. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. 
Now notice that our sons and daughters are going to school right now in the season of the fourth quarter and the first quarter and in the beginning of a new season. Notice that the school, our school years from September to spring, it's interesting that it's in the double portion category. What is our sons and daughters doing now? They're going to school, the third graders, the 12th graders, the college students. What are they doing? They are pro-seeing their future through their education. Oh, you're not gonna, you, you, you. The reason why there is an anointing upon children who go to school or are educated is because they are pro sin and the Spirit of God is upon sons and daughters and they feel the drawing to speak to their future. I'm going to be a nurse. I'm going to be a CEO. I'm going to own a business. I'm going to be a fireman. I'm going to be a doctor. You ask any child who is going to school, ask them, what do you want to be? You can ask a first grader. He'll tell you things in which you'll smile and kind of chuckle. You'll ask a 12th grader and even smile and chuckle. You'll ask a college student. You'll smile and chuckle. And you'll say, I hope that that happens for them. But what you need to know is the Spirit of God is upon them. And God is saying, I will pour it upon all flesh. It won't matter whether the saved or the not saved, I will give them, watch this, I will give them initiative to pro, to pro see their future until they will start speaking to it. That's the reason why, come on, let's get these school names in on the list. Let me get a letter into every principal and every president of college so we can let them know we are prayed for them because God has poured out his spirit. Now this doesn't have anything of being born again. We have, we have, we have affirmed these scriptures many times to say, well, this is when God's gonna pour out his spirit and many people are gonna get saved. He tells us what he's doing. He tells you, I'm gonna do this on all flesh. I'm going to do it on the saved and the unsaved. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a spirit of pro-seeing, of prophesying to your, your sons and daughters are going to do that. And then he said, your old men shall dream dreams. And when you read this, you will begin to study to find out that God says, I'm going to bring big health. I'm going to, I'm going to bring sound minds. This is not dementia, fever of someone dreaming of a dream because they're old and said, oh, they're just dreaming dreams. God has said, no, they're going to have a sound mind that they're going to dream dreams and those dreams will be interpreted by them to other people and they will actually come to pass and they will see things. This is what God is doing. And God says, and young men shall see visions. Now, he comes out of the education or he comes out of the sons and daughters and he says, young men shall see visions in, and ever how you want to categorize young or old. To me, I'm in the young category, so I'm going to take the vision part. You can take the dream part. I'm going to take the vision part because if I got vision, I won't perish. For if you don't have a vision, the people will perish. A vision for my body, a vision for my health, a vision for my, we for my weight, a vision to eat right. I know you feel better because they dropped donut off a of Duncan, but it's still the same thing. The fact is, is you got to get a vision for your, for your health. You got to get vision and some of you need it quick because you're already 50 and 55 and you're overweight and you shouldn't be overweight. You got to get back so that the heart doesn't have to do extra work and your legs won't be tired. Don't wait to the end. Get some vision about, I will be strong. I will exercise. I will be healthy. Come on, somebody, get the vision for your, I will, I'm going to live there, see my great grandchildren and I, I'm going to be a, I'm going to have a sound mind. Don't wait till you get sick in the hospital to start having vision to be better. You need to have vision so much that when you're in the hospital, you're only there for them to fix your vision, which means you're here, I'm here, you're gonna just adjust me because I've already got a vision. I'm not dying, I don't plan to die. I got a vision for my life. 
And it's got to go past barbecue potato chips. It's got to go past all of the grease that we slide down thinking it's no big deal. It is a big deal. And let me tell you something. For all of you that are over 65, you should think about this. That the reason why you're over 65 and you're still living is because God's got a purpose here on this planet for you. There is something that God wants out of you, God's going to do for you, and God is, is, is operating in your life. So young, young men shall have visions. And he, and, he, and, he, and he clearly describes to us that your family is going to have favor. And then he goes on and talks about people who are working. People who work are blessed and people who do not work are not blessed. Oh, listen how quiet that got. See how quiet that got? What are you talking about? Look at the scriptures. Look at it very clearly. He said in, in this double portion season, they'll go back to that scripture verse. They'll go back to it. You'll find, he says, after the vision part, he says, then I'm going to, he said, also upon men servants and upon your handmaidens, in those days I will pour out my spirit. He's got to pour his spirit upon people who work so that the economy can be blessed, so you can inherit the wealth of the wicked. So God pours out his spirit upon people who work, meaning that if you work and do the will of God, which is the will of God, let me help you here. Notice that when Jesus died, that women still have birth pain. So when some BB, pers BB brain person comes to you and says, well, when Jesus died, we don't live under the law. We don't have any more of that stuff. Well, I know that Melody's full of the Holy Ghost and she had birth pains. She screamed like every other woman for give me something for this birth pain. Jesus did not do away from the curse when he died on the cross, that when a woman gives birth to a baby, she does not have birth pains. Why? Simply because God said, that is something that's left alone, that when a woman has a birth pain, number one, she got pregnant right. Number two, she did not abort the baby. Number three, I just want enough pain in her body that when the child comes out, she will start rejoicing and she will love that child like you can't believe and she becomes this protective mother. I'm talking to a lot of protective mothers here. And even if your child is wrong, the mama will agree with the, with, with the child instead of everybody else because she's protective because I gave birth. I know I gave birth because it hurt when I gave birth. And, and God said, I'm not going to remove that part of the curse because it's really a blessing. So the curse is redeemed when the woman gives birth to a child. Then he said something else. He says, uh, something else I'm not going to remove at Calvary. You have to work. You have to sweat. You got to sweat. You got to work. That's how you redeem yourself to get prosperity in your life. Jesus did not die and said, it's all going to come free. You're still going to have to pay the price. You're still going to have to get out of bed. You hear me, lazy person? You're still going to have to get out of bed. You hear me, lazy person? You're going to have to move out. You're 42 years old and you're still living with your mama. You've got to move out. You've got to get a job. All of you that live on welfare and you know better than to live on welfare, and I'm not against welfare because some people need some welfare to help them, but when you are nothing but a cheater and a lazy person, you are cursed and you'll never be blessed. But if you work, God will bless you. There's no, there's no such thing as a free ride being born again. 
I don't have to work. I have to work. I need to feel the eight hours of the puncture, the sweating, and, and the agony, and the responsibility, because God will bless me. And then he says, during the double portion, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the double portion time, I will double, I will double upon the handmaidens. I will double upon the servants. I will double up upon those that work. So everybody that says, I don't like my job, get ready next week for you to automatically have a feeling, I like my job. Not because your flesh is in agreement with that, but you have made up in your mind, wherever I am, God is going to bless me. And I'm going to do it with all of my might. I'm going to do it with all of my zeal. There's a portion of scripture verse in the New Testament that the Bible teaches us that when we go to work and we do work, we are not to do it for the masters in which we work for. They pay us, they give us benefits, they give us this and that, and we agree to work for them for such and such. But the Bible teaches us don't do it unto them. Do it like you're doing it for the Lord. In other words, if you do it like you're doing it for the Lord, you won't cheat. You won't cut corners. You won't rob. You won't steal because you're doing it unto him. And let me tell you, God can bless you way more than what you're getting because he can give you things money can buy. By the way, you're miserable if you don't work. You're miserable if you don't work. He said, well, I'm miserable when I do work. No, no, no. When you work, it's fun to say it's done. I did my eight hours a day. I did my seven hours a day. It's fun on Friday to be exhausted laying on the couch and say, I did it. I did it. I gave it everything I have. And you hold that paycheck and say, mm-hmm. We're going out tonight. Yes, sir, we're going out tonight. We're going we're gonna to dance. We're going to have fun tonight because I worked hard. There's a good feeling about working. And every working person will say amen to that. Now, we don't like it when we're working, but it's a good feeling to know I've done a good job. But better than that, God looks down and says, you have done a good job. I'm really going to bless you. You say, but I'm retired. I don't work anymore. Volunteer in the church because volunteering in the kingdom is the highest paid position on planet Earth. Soon as you realize that volunteering in the kingdom is probably one of the most powerful investments you could ever give. Many people want to be paid. That's all right. But let me tell you what's better is when you volunteer. Don't you know there's a God in heaven if he sees every bird that falls and he knows the number of hairs upon your head that when he sees you in the kingdom doing something for him, He's going, to pay, he's going to pay you like you have never been paid. There's no man, no company. There's no benefits like the benefits of God. And this younger generation, this younger generation needs to learn that. We need to teach this younger generation. Give of yourself to be in the choir. Give of yourself to be an usher. Give of yourself to fix a light. Give of yourself to to rub down the furniture. Give of yourself to build in the kingdom of God. Because I'm not doing this for Pastor Steve. I'm doing this for God. And when God sees that, he will bless you abundantly. You know this is a fact when... When God called the angels together in the book of Job, the book of Job is in the Old Testament, J-O-B. Most of you know about Job because whether you're a Bible reader or know the Bible, you know the name Job. But if I was to take you for the next four or five minutes to show you he's living in the exact season we are in right now. God is getting ready to have a meeting on the Day of Atonement. Listen to me now. When you study when God brought all of the angels together, it happened to be on the Day of Atonement. 
When you study the seasons and study when God acknowledges all the angels to come together, then you, you notice something in the book of Job that when God had this celestial convention of legions of zillions of angels in the crystal cathedral of heaven, and you hear the flapping of millions and trillions of angels' wings until the breeze of that is in the mass audience of a celestial gathering that no man can even conceive, bigger than the Grand Canyon, bigger than the Alps. There is no auditorium. There is no building, no mountain, no cavern, nothing, even Yellowstone in all of its great beauty. The oceans could captivate the auditorium that God held billions and billions of angels in a roll call of meeting. And there's one throne. And when God enters, the angels begin to shout with different levels of keys and voices and sounds we have not yet heard. We have A, B, C, D, E, F. But there's more keys on God's piano and more notes than you can ever imagine. And there's more octaves and more celestial voices that what we think is incredible that we hear. Amazing to hear that voice. You cannot imagine the sultry and the, and the beauty and, and, and the built-in given talents to angels that God has done that makes music that would just make any rock concert, Taylor Swift, Beyonce, put them all together. You can't get near the sound of lights and spectacularism in the presence of when God calls and he did it on the Day of Atonement. It is so incredible Satan who used to direct the band, the orchestra, before God enters into that celestial moment. Bays, Lucifer, a beautiful angel. Bible says in his being is pipes, voices, sounds and magical things that come that he can do even today, even in this world that he has demonstrated it through the lights and through the creativity of movies and Hollywood. That's all Satan God put in him as he's come to this earth to try to magnify his influence. He's very talented. He's unbelievably talented. He's so talented he can create music to make a generation take their clothes off. He is so talented he can make you commit adultery in songs and concerts. He is so talented he can make you a pervert. He is so talented he can convince you you are not a boy, you're a girl. And a girl, a boy. He is so talented he can take a beautiful, young, talented man and make him not like the opposite sex and turn him into a beast. A beast. An animal. Read it in Romans. They did not like to retain God in their knowledge, so God said, I'll turn you into a beast. No desire naturally to love children and to want children and to be married, but in fact to go beyond with, the, with, with, with ludicrous thoughts and Lucifer, his talent. By the way, Satan don't commit adultery. He don't vape. He don't get drunk. 
He don't get in homosexual acts. He doesn't get in the bed and commit adultery. He's good enough to get you to do it. So he can accuse you. Because God can never say to him, you did that. Oh, no, I never did that. The only thing I did is I rebelled against you and thought I could esteem myself. Because when you get in front of a crowd, you know how much evil you got inside of you. Lucifer couldn't handle the celestial crowd for he was the director before God would walk in because the only way God will come into any atmosphere is through praise. That's the reason why Revelation says all the angels night and day, holy, 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 holy. God will never move anywhere unless he hears his name and, and hears somebody saying, holy, mighty are you, O God. Oh, great and greatly to be great. That's when he moves in. And he comes to the meeting, this meeting on Atonement Day in the book of Job. Michael or Gabriel, oh, we're talking about, we're talking about, I can't even use the number. You think he would be intimidated because God sent, watch this, God sent every angel a special telegram of invitation to be this important meeting. And Satan didn't get an invitation. But since he's the father of all lies, he said, I will get in with a lie because I look just like them. And when I get to the gate and they ask me for my identification, I will tell them I'm an angel. Look at me. He got in. Read it. He got into the meeting. Michael or Gabriel moves up to the presence of God. He's here. He's here. Who's here? He's here. Now here's what's really interesting is that Satan knows how to worship God. Are you shocked? Oh, he joined in. Probably was the loudest among them because he's the talentedest one. Don't you remember when Jesus got out of the boat and the man who lived in the tomb who was, who was full of legions of devils and before Jesus cast them out and they went into the pigs and the pigs went into the Sea of Galilee? Do you know what the Bible says when Jesus got out of the boat? Do you know what this man who's got chains, his fingernails look like huge witch fingernails? He's, 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 he's screaming and foaming at the mouth. His exorcism is just, just out of this convulsive situation. And the Bible said he ran toward Jesus and the Bible said, read it for yourself, he worshiped. I'm going to tell you, all your friends who don't like to come to church, one day they're going to worship for the Bible said, every knee is going to bow, every tongue is going to confess. They have cussed you out before they come to church, but one day you're going to see your relatives on their knees saying you are holy and mighty. but never enter into heaven. But when they meet him on the judgment seat of Christ's day, they'll worship him like you worship him. So quit worrying about what your relatives think because they're going to do it someday even though they're going to hell because they rejected him. He will hear out of their body and their mind, mouth what he wanted to hear, but they would not give it to him because their will chose another direction, but he will get his praise, even from the sickest of the sick, even from the demon of the demon, because you are serving a God who is that powerful. And somebody tells him, God, he's here. Who? Your music director. Your songstress. 
The music man's here. He's in the back. Tell him to come here. Read it for yourself. Tell him to come here. There was no way that Satan could even get near God unless he worshipped his way all the way to God. And he wanted all the angels in which he took a third of the heavens. Remember this. When you're demon possessed, you will affect other people to be demon possessed. For the Bible says that he convinced a third of the heavens to go with him. So when you're in a cluster of people and they're talking about other people or other things, you better be careful because when you get about two or three demon-possessed people talking in a conversation, you have no chance but to get up and to resist it and say, excuse me, I got to go to bed because it will enter into you and you will enter into the same conversation and start speaking the same thing. He had to worship his way to God. There was no way to get to God unless he worshiped his way. And he looked at the angel and said, look at him. He's worshiping me. I know. You're holy. You're mighty. You're great. I know who you are. Good. I want everybody to see it. Tell him where you're going. I'm going to hell. Tell him who made it. You did. Tell him. There's no recourse because I did not want recourse. I will not go back. Tell them who's going with you. Tell them what I made for you and, and those that followed you. Hell. Everybody hear that? And the angels are just about done with their worshiping because Michael has got a chain in one hand, it's been dragging around and they want to help Michael chain him for what he has done. And then God asked him, it's all right, Michael, it's all right, angels. What do you want? Well, it's a day of atonement. You make decisions. There's a guy you're blessing. I can't get to him. You got a hedge around him. He's richer than Amazon. He's richer than Bill Gates. He's rich. Yes. I want to prove something to you. And what's that? The season's about to change. I know you're making decisions, sir. It's atonement time. But sir, if you just take your heads down, I will show you he really doesn't love you because he only loves you because you give him money. That's all the reason why he loves you is you give him money. You give him sons and daughters. He doesn't love you to love you doesn't really worship you. And every morning when he goes out and gives an offering, that's nothing but fake. Really. Really. Mm. Well, I'll take the hedge down. Because I have a feeling, sir. Just let me remind you. You're going to hell. And the people you talked into leaving the church, they're going to hell too. I'm not convinced that that man, Job, loves me because I give him money and riches and favor. Can I prove it to you now? Absolutely. And with a snarl, he looks at those celestial angels and says, it's showtime. Let me give you a light show. 
Let me give you a concert. Let me give you Hollywood. Because the story has just begun. That morning, unbeknownst to Job, his oldest boy came by the house in front of the altar because Job built an altar and the Bible said he gave worship and sacrifice every morning to God. And the boy comes and says, Dad, we have a family reunion. And the seven sons and the three daughters are the seven daughters, three of what I had seven sons, three daughters, that's what it was. And their wives and the grandchildren will be there. Will you come? Listen to what Job says. Son, I would love to come to that family reunion. But there's so many of you, I am so concerned that you will not be blessed. I'm going to stay by the altar. Read it for yourself. I'm going to stay by the altar and make sure that none of my kids get a demon spirit in them. And I'm not coming to the family union. Read it, it's right there. They go to the family union. Sometime in about 15 or 20 minutes, all of a sudden out of nowhere, fire falls from the heavens like, like you have never seen. Huge fire in the heavens. Huge! All of a sudden, here comes one of Job's people, and he comes, he's, he's burnt. Flesh is hanging. His clothes are completely burnt. He's staggering like a drunk man. He's half dead and will die before he gets his words out. He will die right in front of Job, in front of the altar, and says, Sir, and falls to the ground, and he's screaming to his wife, get some, get, get some water. My God, what's happened to you? And he says these words. He gets it out, and then he dies. Fire came from the heavens and consumed 3,000 sheep. And every shepherd, they're dead. What? The wife comes. What did he say? All the sheep are gone. That means all the clothing factories, all the Walmarts, all the Macy's, all of the, all the seamstresses, all the, all, the, all the clothing of the world. For we supply it all. And as, that, as, as he was finishing, another man comes who's cut open like somebody has jabbed him with a couple swords. He's bleeding. Blood's running everywhere. He gets right to Job and barely gets it out and tells him out of nowhere, someone came and stole 3,000 semi-trucks or camels that supply the world with all the vegetation of all the miles of land that you have, the richest man in the world, and stole and, and killed every camel driver and dies. And while he yet spake, another one comes. 500 farm mill tractors. Oh, then those days was donkeys, harvesters, have been stolen and they have killed every tractor or donkey driver. And he dies. And then another one comes and says, Sir, 500 yoke oxen, tractors that plow the field by the miles have been stolen and destroyed. Dies. That's bad enough to lose everything you have in a matter of 15 minutes. Bankrupt. No money. Nothing. But what's really worse is the last man who comes, who's holding his head like a bowling ball that's been cracked open on the shoulders, staggering, screaming. And before he can get to his knees to die, he tells Job, a storm has come to the family union. It's ground zero, sir. Your children are dead. like a wild maniac, like any father who cares about my money, who cares about my, all of my wealth, my kids. He runs while his wife grabs the back of his garment screaming like a wild woman. She's already gone to cussing. 
stupid God. To hell with God. F you, God! He keeps pulling on that woman. He gets the ground zero. They dig through the rubbish of seven sons and seven daughter-in-laws and three daughters and their husbands and their kids and no sleep because every servant is dead with his fingernails full of blood and dirt pulling kids out of timbers while the woman is screaming like she's in travail and the devil dances. It's showtime. Puts every light he's got on the scene. Plays his music as loud as he can play it. And God sits on the throne. And he buries those kids one by one. Staggers so tired with blood on his body. Exhausted from hours and all night long burying those kids. Until he walks back to his home. And walks past the offering plate. The offering plate. I hate the offering plate. I hate it! Don't you tell me to give my tithe. Don't you tell me to give one thing on that altar. He goes in. He grabs a huge sharp knife and his wife is saying, what in the blank are you going to do? He pulls on her while she pulls on his rope. Did you get near that altar? Did you get near that offering plate? Did you get near that? Leave me alone. Curse God and die! God watches and Satan says, it's almost, it's almost fireworks time. Y'all watching? Y'all watching? You watch it, God? You're going to see a man sell his soul out. I got him. Here is wife. He missing his wife. F you, God. Damn you, God. But the Bible says his wife said, curse God and die. He takes a huge knife. The reason why she said curse God and die is because when he had a knife in his hand, she thought he was going to kill himself. And she said, go on, kill me first. And then while I'm dying, I want you to ram that thing into your body. And I want you to throw yourself against the offering plate of, the, of that altar. And I want to hear you say it. Damn you, God. The Bible said, God waits. It's atonement. Atonement evening is just about over with. He cuts his hair. Shaves his head. Throws his hair on the altar. Because he didn't have anything to give. Because the devil stole all of his money. And the devil knew then, if he can't put nothing on the altar, he can't be blessed. The Bible said he cut his hair, threw it on the altar, cuts the clothes off of his body, steps out nude and puts it on the altar. And the Bible said he fell on his knees, threw his hands up, and he worshiped God. atonement said sucker you see that now you give him back double you give him back double and 
So the question arises, did he give him 14 sons and did he give him six daughters? He only gave him another seven sons and another three daughters because he told Job, the other sons and the other daughters, they're just fine up here. And some of you have the audacity to let a headache keep you away from worshiping God. You got something to do on Sunday, it's more important than to be at the presence of God. And Satan, right now, with every human being, has got his finger on you, convincing God you're a fake. And when I throw a curveball at them, and I throw distress, and I throw sickness at them, and I throw pain at them, they're going to damn you and there'll be no relationship and God waits and says don't do it worship me worship me in the midst of the storm worship me when nothing's not happening the apostle Paul tells us Nothing shall separate me from the love of God. It's time. The 10 days that's coming is when the accusation of the devil is going to be the strongest. But that's when you're going to be the strongest to say, Lord, forgive me. God is going to rise up and he's going to say, I've had enough of you. You have touched my people long enough. I'm getting ready to give them double health, double faith, double on their children, double with their life. He's a good God. <laughs> and if you're going in through anything, I got some good words for you. Jesus made this deal at Calvary. And he told the devil, I'm going to bash your head in. But there's one other thing I'm going to make. I'm going to tell you, devil. When I come into people's lives, you won't be able to do what you think. Because I won't put on them more than they are able. You can only go so far with your heart attack and your cancer and your high blood pressure and your dementia and your, and your poverty. You can only go so far. But if I get you to stand and give me the atonement offering, do not stand empty before me. I will break the powers. I will make the devil go into the vaults of where your stuff is that he's locked up. And he will give you back what he's stolen. But he's going to have to give you back double. Let me tell you, let me tell you, God is about to do something incredible in your life. Everybody say double. double. Say double. double. So can I tell you a little secret? There's been a conversation between the devil and God. But God's got more confidence in you than he has the devil. And he's already told the devil, I don't believe they'll break. I don't believe nothing will break them. I don't care what you throw at them, nothing will break them. And when you stand in this moment and this season, ladies and gentlemen, the best is yet to come. The fire can't burn us. The floods can't drown us. The lions cannot eat us. Aren't you glad you're living in a good season? In a good season. Everybody say hallelujah. Everybody that's encouraged say hallelujah. We're going to take the Wednesday offering. I'm going to put some more offering on the altar. 
going to be faithful in this moment going to be faithful in what God has done in our lives I drove up to the parking lot today and I was stopped by a sister she's here I think she's singing let me see if she's up here I think she's up here she was so she was so cheerful I was not in a good mood I was not as cheerful as her I'm looking for her. I know she she usually sings up here and she's coming in the car and it's three o'clock in the afternoon she says oh pastor I want to tell you something I'm coming to, to give some missionary offering and I'm going to put it in the little slot. we got a little slot out there where you can give your tithing. And she says, I've come to give my tithing. I can't wait till offering time. I want to do it now. And she was so jubilant and so happy. I thought, my God, this woman's getting ready to be blessed. Because not even the devil can make her eat three hamburgers a day and steal the money. She was excited about giving. Anybody excited about giving God an, an offering? Just an offering. By the way, this is better than a movie tonight. How much would you pay to go to the movies? How much popcorn would you eat? You heard a good story tonight. You heard a true story. One of double portion. You could take an envelope out, the envelope that was given to you. You can do it that way. You can do it with your phone. Many of you are doing it with your phone. And you're saying, God, I'm going to honor you with worship. I'm going to honor you with my offering. By the way, does anybody know at the end of the story what happened to Job? When God spoke to his friends and they gave him seven rams and seven sheep. And they said, you could start your business over again. Do you know what Job did? The Bible said he took everyone and put them on the altar. Because Job knew what the devil tried to do to me is steal my goods where I couldn't give an offering. But now I spoke to people to give me an offering. Now I'm going to give an offering. And he got double back everything. That, you read that. You read that. Father, we thank you for this offering. We thank you for the double portion that's coming on the people. We thank you for the elders. After this service, Lord, we're going to have an elders meeting. It's going to be good. And Lord, you're going to touch the elders and touch the house. And Sunday's going to be great. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Somebody say, thank you, Lord. As the, as the offering containers start passing you, if they've already passed you, if they've already done that, just stand to your feet. If they've already come your row, if they haven't, just sit there till they come to your row. Help us, help the ushers. And passing the altar, that's what that container is. It's an altar. Put it in the altar. Touch your phone to the altar. That container, that's an altar. In the balcony, that's, a, that's an altar. You just touch it with your phone. You, you put something in it. You, you give to the altar. This is my worship. My worship. Your offering, your tithing is worship. We give it to you, O oh God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Somebody help these ushers. And look around to make sure that the ushers responding to everyone if it's past you stand to your feet if it's come near you come to your feet thank you Lord somebody say thank you Lord everybody say I love you Jesus say Lord I will always worship you you're wonderful Lord nothing is going to stop me now. Stop me. Everybody lift holy hands like this. Just lift holy hands like this. It says, I'm, I'm getting ready, Lord, for the double portion. Just say that. I'm getting ready for the double portion. Say this out loud to God. Make him feel good. Say, no devil, no devil. is going to stop me now. Whatever he's thrown at me, he's going to have to give me double back what he's stolen from me. I will be blessed. I'm in a new season. God's going to do a great work. In fact, the Lord is releasing some things right now upon everybody has got their hands out. The Lord is releasing some things upon you right now. And also the Lord has come for your words. And also the Lord is going to begin, not just, not just when we step into the new season, but he's finishing up this former rain. Receive it right now. 
receive it right now. Just say, oh Lord, I receive it. Say, Lord, I receive it. You that are watching, Lord, I receive it. I receive it. God's touching eyes. God's touching blood. God's touching hearts. God's touching spines. God's, God's touching money. God's touching bank accounts. God's touching marriages. God's touching children. Oh, just say hallelujah. Everybody shout holy. Holy. Father, we ask you to receive this holy offering. We ask you, oh God, this is what this is what you desire. So we put it on the altar and we give it to you. Notice, God, we always bring it to the altar. Notice that we don't go out the back with it. We bring it to the altar. We put the offering on the altar. And everybody say, we bless you, O God, with the offering and with the tithing in Jesus' name. Now, everybody, clap your hands for joy. Get glad. Come on, get glad. Get glad. Get glad. Turn to somebody and say, double portion is coming on. You just say that. God bless you. Elders, we're going to meet upstairs. Sing us out. Well, we have experienced tonight a strong move of the Holy Spirit. I want to say thank you. And of course, God is going to answer the prayers. But Monday Labor Day prayer was so well attended as people came from the north, the south, and the east, and the west. I was so moved. Usually I don't open my eyes till almost the end of the prayer. But it was so encouraging as I began to see the people from front to back, in the balcony, in the cascades, lifting their hands, praising God. It was an exciting, exciting moment. I'm excited about what God is doing because God is up to great things. You heard the testimonies even in this service. Prepare your hearts. Healing is coming. Restoration is coming. God is up to something huge for the people that know it's going to happen. It's so sad when people don't know it's going to happen because it will not happen. But when you know the seasons, and you know the times, you are the ones that are gonna benefit from the outpouring. I wanna encourage you Friday morning, I'll be praying, you can join in, Facebook, YouTube, you pray with me at six o'clock in the morning. And then of course, Sunday is gonna be great. Also our Saturday night service streaming is, is back, so you can turn it on at 5.30, our streaming on Saturday evening. Then as we have the services, 8.30, 10.30, and our 12.30 streaming. So I'm excited about what God is doing in your life. Father, I pray on this Wednesday, Lord, just a few days before a beginning of a new season, that the power of the Holy Spirit come upon every hearer. Let them experience the prayer that was prayed for them and what God is doing in their life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, I can't wait to hear what God is going to do in your life. God bless you, and yes, you can. Amen.